Like formal, what we call like formal meditation, where you actually practice samadhi and take time to. This is this is a good practice to cultivate because daily life uh, can be just going from one thing to another, and and this idea of medi- having periods of just stopping where you. Watch the breath, or collect yourself from the maybe busy, active life. So it's, it, uh, if it's possible, you know, because uh, sometimes we live in situations where we have no, not much privacy or opportunity, but. Um, When we do, that's uh, that's uh, good to integrate it into one's life. Like uh, it gives a form, a quality. Then also, we do forget. We get carried away with with our vipaka kama, like the resultant kama of past actions. And this. Uh, this also helps us to periods of silent meditation, of sitting, of walking. We, give a, we begin to get uh, perspective on it, and uh, we become more confident. Like over the years, the confidence in the practice increases as you as you witness the result of it. <coughs> So then it applies to uh, d- not just the formal meditation exercises, but uh, just life itself. So, uh, you know, when one integrates mindfulness into traveling, into the workplace, into just doing the most ordinary things, uh, ordinary, mundane, daily activities. And so much of our life is is a kind of habit pattern, perfunctory kind of doing things, because that's what we're used to doing. Where mindfulness puts it in a perspective, we begin to to uh, not just operate out of the momentum of habit, and or compulsion. We have compulsive tendencies uh, in regards to certain things, and these can all be seen in terms of being aware, listening, uh, beginning to see them from the wisdom level rather than the personal, personal problem attitude. Because uh, we're not practicing to get rid of our personality, but to no longer be deluded by it. For example, Ajahn Chah was a very charming personality, his charismatic, uh, and so this was one one monk asked him what. You're very charming. Is this uh, a problem? And he, he called it his magnet. He could draw people in and then uh, kind of charm them. And then they began to listen to Dhamma. When he was saw they were ready, then 
he could teach them Dhamma. Other monks are, or meditators may not have charisma or personal charm, but it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean they're, uh, you know, it just, it's just, these are just individual characteristics. How to use what you, the way you are for the uh, compassion, out of compassion for others. So you're not you're not trying to be like anyone else. You know you're not trying to imitate Lung Pa Cha or Lung Pu Man. This is this isn't what we do. But we're we're learning to you know operate from from uh, from the way we are, from the kind of character tendency, personality, uh, uh, karmic tendencies that we have and and uh, because we're seeing it from the wisdom level rather than from the personal. Um, we're not seeking popularity or or approval. If we are, we begin to see that as a condition, a sakya ditti, a uh, uh, diff, uh, uh, an obstruction to the path. Integrating this in, like into into ordinary activities. Just waiting in a queue. And I travel a lot. I uh, travel a lot, so. When, uh, on international flights and that I develop I began to see how uh, you know my personal tendency would be when you're going through immigration or customs or waiting for your bags to appear on a carousel you know, there's this I impatience for example waiting for your baggage when people be waiting outside to receive me in some place uh, and my aim was to get the bag and and go out and meet the people, and and if it didn't come right away, then get impatient and start thinking maybe they lost my my bag or whatever. Uh, and uh, several times they have, <laughs> but uh, this uh, I mean they found it again, but they they. Um, what observing is the way you know, I would react to just this simple kind of thing of waiting for your bag to appear on a carousel is like this. So I can actually integrate mindfulness into something that was you're just doing it to get out. You know, you you're just gritting your teeth and hoping your bag appears soon so you can go out and meet people. That have come to receive you, or waiting in a queue for immigration, you can, uh, you know, you when the, you've been on an airplane with a lot of people and you, the lines are long. You can feel as you're looking, for, want to get through the line as quickly as possible, and just these kind of restless activities and habits that we have in regards to waiting, <coughs> waiting for the bus, waiting for the train. Is a good, I mean, we can s see these as opportunities to be aware of, say, the aramana, the, the mood that we're experiencing at that time. And through that awareness, then we stop creating the, and do just a <coughs> reinforcing a habit, or just not noticing it anymore. But uh, but actually using a situation, a quite ordinary, non-threatening situation, as practice of meditation. Where when we think sitting in the meditation halls, where where it's at then we would see waiting in a queue as kind of a, an interruption to our practice. Or how are we going to relate 
there's a different way of looking at waiting in a queue. Doing things like washing dishes or uh, doing the laundry can be in integrated, being aware and being with what you're doing, you know, so it's, you're not off in a, in a, in a world uh, where you don't know what's going on, but you're, you're aware, you know, of the situation, because awareness allows you to be aware of the environment, the time, the place, and your own uh, mood and, rea and emotional reactions to the conditions that you're experiencing. So, like this morning, I was talking about mindfulness, the sound of silence, uh, <coughs> which includes everything. Like this attitude of listening, not for anything in particular. You're not listening for or uh, to anything in particular, but it includes everything that that, that makes sounds in the present, whether they're pleasant or. <coughs> unpleasant or whatever the the quality quantity might be the attitude is this this uh, listening and then the, the quality if it's a noise we don't like then we feel aversion <coughs> that's a mental state we create out of our <coughs> not wanting an unpleasant noise Unpleasant noise such as my cough. <laughs> I didn't want that. Another <coughs> reflection is on like the, the different teachers have different methods of meditate have certain methods or attitudes of what practice is about and so it can be confusing because what if 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 you're learning to meditate and then you go to various Ajahn's are various teachers. Um, one can become very confused by it. <coughs> because uh, some some teachers come from a very, you know, <coughs> authoritarian position. This is the only way to practice, uh, is my way. Or you've got to get something in order to become enlightened is a common one, a common way of talking. And not that these are wrong, you know, it's not judgment, judging, but we can be aware of how uh, somebody, an authority figure affects us. For example, how, my, how, how do I affect you at this time? I'm in, a, in the high seat giving these reflections and what you can know, whether I'm right or wrong, is that uh, you feel that like this. You know, this is uh, the what you're emotionally uh, experiencing now is the way it is. And uh, in the Buddhist world, there are, there are so many views and opinions about the way to practice that and and t 
teaching, when you teach Dhamma, you tend to teach from your own experience. So, fair enough, you're not, uh, people don't, can't really practice exactly like I do, because uh, it's just not that way. We, we learn from various techniques, from various other methods, but the the result is always trust your your awareness of the result of if you're attached to a view or if you're caught in confusion or if you you know you the one of the, the common attitudes I found was people attaching to m methods of meditation without reflection so the you kind of empower somebody's method uh, of a certain technique of practice. Uh, as if you keep doing it over and over, then you will become enlightened rather than the method itself just leading onward toward a more uh, awareness to be aware of that actually uh, it's, a, it's a helpful tool towards samadhi, towards mindfulness, but but the grasping of the method can be very disappointing because it, it it's the grasping, the blind grasping of anything, of Buddhism itself, of, of uh, positions on Dhamma that, that is the obstruction. Is the obstacle. So some uh, some teacher, like uh, I went to a conference in London years ago at the School of Oriental Studies, and it was an uh, international conference from scholars from all over the world on Buddhism would assembling, and I was a speaker, and most of these people were, you know. Uh, quite renowned scholars, and they had v various views about uh, Buddhism, and and a lot of uh, not many of them weren't even Buddhist or practitioners of it. And uh, and I'm not a scholar. I'm not scholastically inclined. Uh, the, the, so to me, it was a lot of it was rather boring, and uh, but I noticed when I gave my my address, they 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 didn't seem to understand what I was talking about, <laughs> <laughs> and yet they could come. Uh, this is a general impression I had, but but uh, but the uh, but. Scholars and people that have like um, that study a lot can come from a very uh, kind of peremptory position. You know, this is this is what the Buddha actually meant, and argue about the meaning of dukkha or or the function of paticca samuppada dependent origination, and and how much samadhi you should get before you do vipassana, and and these kind of views and one holds to then they they become you know like it uh, demanding that you believe it what you can know is that when somebody talks to you in an authoritative way this is what you feel do you feel do you believe or trust or do you feel intimidated does it create doubt or uncertainty does it create aversion, resistance, or loyalty? I mean, whatever uh, reaction you you you're emotionally experiencing, you you know it. It's like this. It's the way it is. So we don't have to kind of prove one way is right and another wrong, or that that what I say is is absolutely right and what some other teacher says is wrong. But we can what we can know at this very moment is that this is 
the aramana, the arom, the the mood, the state, the mental state is like this. <coughs> so this is beginning to then you're then you're beginning to trust yourself to operate from the wisdom level, the panya level, rather than uh, through belief in teachings and doctrines and in methods of meditation and in your own personal views or what author the authorities say. You're beginning to use the way things are as a path for liberation. Yes. I choose to spend much of my time and retirement as a training activist. This involves much sankara of politics and people. In ten days' time, I'll be having a canoe on Newcastle Harbour attended to that in front of Flock of Pages. I was born a Christian activist, so now I'm a Buddhist. But it's not easy. Is it possible? Uh, yes, it certainly is. <laughs> I mean, this is where, you know, it, it, it can, when I talk like this, it can sound very passive, like you're just sit, you're sitting there watching your moods just come and go and, and you don't do anything, but <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the limitation of language itself. But you can also be aware of obsessive, compulsive tendencies in yourself around activity, around causes. It doesn't mean that you, you don't actively do things, but you can be aware of, of how sometimes uh, political causes or environmental causes can be a source of a lot of suffering because of the way you're holding it and the disappointment when or the kind of indignation one feels when when things don't go the right way it's all grist for the mill and people have different talents different abilities uh, so that this is you know this doesn't mindfulness doesn't make us into zombies or, you know, totally in, incapable of just but sitting quietly and w watching states of mind. It, it, it allows us to, when we do act, then it's, then it's in the Eightfold Path, it's Sama Waja, Sama Gamanto, Sama Achivo, right speech, right action, right livelihood. <coughs> so our actions are coming from from wisdom rather than from just uh, anger or indignation or or obsessive uh, uh, tendencies <coughs> then uh, then they c then the, then it's truly really a blessing when when our actions come from wisdom it's also a blessing Where when our actions come from righteousness, then we we tend to to you know then it, that becomes a very strong emotion, and we feel uh, indignant, and you know then you can say uh, kill the evil forces or <laughs> whatever <laughs> you know kill the abortionists or or the the animal exploiters i mean it goes into into madness but in uh but it's not about annihilating the evil but understanding evil is is uh, is a sankara is not absolute it's not permanent so some conditions are you have these different qualities and <coughs> When we're aware of uh, evil of 
evil thoughts in our in our own minds or destructive thoughts or angry thoughts uh, revenge vendetta that kind of thing we, that awareness is what is our refuge not not the the judgment or the action or the speech that comes from having such feelings because we, we all you know like they talk about the dark side of life and is uh, is there an absolute evil force in the universe <laughs> and uh, this these are common questions uh, you know so uh, the forces of evil dominating and uh, uh, what is the nature of humanity what is our true nature and then uh, you know there there's those that said well our true nature is you know to uh, you know like a psychopath live your life at the expense of others or is it, you know, is uh, when we see with wisdom, then it doesn't mean we never have evil thoughts or emotions, but it means w we know them in terms of non-action. We don't act on that. We don't speak on that. It is a sankara, so it's gr it's 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 the path you're seeing. Uh, it, but it's the passive side, you know, so we do the good uh, when we have good thoughts, good intentions, then we we can act or speak on that. And that's that's blessing or merit. But uh, we can also have the opposite, uh, totally mean and selfish and angry thoughts. But they're also sankaras, but we we refrain from acting or speaking on those those sankaras. So, say on the activist side, our active side is to do the good, refrain from from doing the evil one, evil things that we might find in our consciousness. That's what I particularly like the Buddhism's attitude towards morality, because I was brought up as a Christian where even a bad thought was a sin, you know. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, it would be immoral. You'd have immoral thoughts or emotions, and. And uh, when you're adolescent, when you're in puberty, when you're maturing, you, you don't you don't know what's happening half the time, and you have all kinds of sexual thoughts and and energies going through the body, and you, they consider them evil. At least I was told they were. So uh, so you you know what do you do? You feel guilty. And you feel hopeless because you think, uh, you know, that it's, uh, you shouldn't have this, uh, such things, such thoughts or fantasies or whatever. With Buddhism, the, the emphasis on sila, on morality, is it's, uh, it's about action and speech, not around thought. So, uh, so, uh, there's not such thing as Im immoral thought. A thought can be, you know, have different qualities of good and bad, but then as we de develop wisdom, then we trust in the, in the, in the good, we, our actions or uh, our relationship to our family, to our society, is to do the good and refrain from doing the bad. And that's balance, and that's wisdom. It doesn't mean you you only have good thoughts for the rest of your life, <laughs> but uh, even the bad ones are part knowledge, and because they they are impermanent, can uh, condition phenomena, and not so. And that that makes life 
that may, you know, then we, we are, uh, you know, in teaching in the UK for so many years, there's so many guilt problems, guilt, people guilty about things they've said or done in the past. <coughs> and so it's interesting to uh, see if people, very good people, you know, most of the people, you know, that come to monasteries are trying to be on the best behavior. And, but uh, I noticed that that guilt can be an obsessive concern, regret, or or remembering things you've done or said uh, that you feel guilty about. And so, guilt is, is because you remember and. Um, and you feel guilty and, and, uh, because we've all done things, uh, you know, on unkind things or things we wished we hadn't done or said in the past. But with wisdom, then then guilt becomes another uh, sankhara arising, ceasing. We're being being able to to use it as. Uh, seeing it for what it really is in the present, if it's like this. We're accepting it. We're not. We're not uh, convincing ourselves we have nothing to be guilty of. But we're we're looking at it from the wi from the wisdom position rather than from uh, social mores or or religious uh, teachings. We're seeing that that this is a uh, emotion. If if we're if we have done things in the past that we regret, then we can, if we can, we apologize or make amends. And best, we, but so much of it isn't, is it? You know, is so long ago that it, it, there's nothing much we can do about it. But we can use it as, as a, uh, with with this wisdom, mindfulness, and wisdom. Also, you know, the, because we tend to suppress, we're afraid of evil, uh, a lot of fear, and fear is 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 a primal kind of emotion. It's this is a fear realm we're living in. Uh, you know, there's a survival. It's survival of the fittest, law of the jungle. Uh, in Thailand, we I live right next to a national park, where you know it's a real jungle of survival for the animal kingdom. <coughs> and uh, hum, you know, we we consider ourselves civilized, so we we can make agreements about our behavior. You know, we can we can agree not to kill, so, or at least other human beings. So like the the first precept, bana di bata, uh, is uh, to is is a moral agreement by by all of us not to intentionally kill another human being. Now this this is this is a gift we have as human human beings. Our species can do this. The animal world can't do that. You know, you ask a cat to not kill birds because it's immoral. They, they don't understand, <laughs> and they—I mean, you can threaten them when 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 you're around. They don't chase birds, but when you're gone, they do. But in because uh, that's their nature. That's what they're supposed to do, actually. And uh, and it's uh, morality doesn't apply. But for the human species, we we have these. Social agreements, moral agreements. Now, just think if everybody, and this is being very <laughs> far out, but if everybody in the world took the first precept, that would be the end of war, wouldn't it? We, uh, all these terrible things going on in the Middle East, and there's no 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 agreement on bana di bata. It's, it's the power, th fear, threatening, uh, 
using using fear and and threats and power to dominate to to resolve conflict so you you know you suppress it is the is the best you can achieve with that but the actual uh, elegance of being human is that that we can agree we it doesn't mean we never feel the desire to kill anything it's not that it's but if we don't act on that desire where when we can like the second precept of not taking things that are, have not been given this is we still feel we feel might feel the impulse to steal or take things that aren't ours, but we don't act on them. It's it's our inactive side, but it doesn't mean we never have that uh, that that kind of desire. Sexuality, like God made so many cha, is about being learning to. To not use sexuality for what, just selfish ends, for just uh, using others or abusing oneself, <laughs> uh, getting obsessed with it. So, so that our sexuality, we can take, we, we can agree uh, how we're going to to r respond to situations. But um, by refraining from acting just on, on uh, lust, lustful impulses. But we can be aware of lustful impulses, kind of sankaras, and seeing them in, in this, and then this gamme uh, sumicha is, is, is that kind of uh, moral agreement we make as Buddhists. And then the Fourth Samavaja is about uh, refraining from using speech. There's a, there's a conflict now in the world around political correctness. And, uh, and yet free speech is, is the attitude of the time. You know, I have a right to say what I, uh, what anything I want to say. And uh, I mean, I was, uh, student in Berkeley in the early 60s, the free speech movement. And that was, I remember the, on the Berkeley campus, University of California, you know, <coughs> they have these meetings and demand right to use the F word in public. <laughs> and it's like, and I, <laughs> I didn't particularly want to devote my, my life to this kind of freedom. <laughs> but, uh, it's free speech. Why not? Just uh, we have a r we're we're free individuals to say uh, what we're thinking, <laughs> and then this political correctness is even more confusing because you're not supposed to say things that offend people, and yet you have a right to <laughs> say anything. <laughs> so if you're confused, uh, it, it's the time. It's the, the way things are, but in uh, Samawaja, right speech. Notice that this is, is it right speech or skillful speech rather than, than political correctness or freedom of speech. And I remember telling monks how grateful I am for all the things I've never said. <laughs> Thinking back, <laughs> things I felt like saying I've never said them. <laughs> and, uh, uh, where, where right speech is knowing time and place, how to communicate, learning to use the, our ability to speak so that it's communicative, it's, it's, it's helpful, it leads onward, it's encouraging, it's not insulting or abusing or, or uh, looking down on people. And this, you know, is, is right speech so this uh, this is learning to to be responsible for what we say 
sometimes we want to use abusive speech or we feel angry and we want to lash out and say things. And so that still, one still can feel that way, but refrain from speaking on it. And this is, this is, uh, you know, a species, uh, human species, this is what we can do, you know, we, it's what civilization uh, really means to, to agree uh, on, on moral, on action and speech, what are the boundaries set by, sometimes the, it, it's without wisdom, so it tends to be oppressive. Morality can can seem oppressive uh, because it it comes from fear. You know, you'll go to hell if you break a precept, or uh, if you tell a lie, you you go to some kind of horrible place in the afterlife. And so, a lot of o obeying laws and and moral precepts is through fear of punishment. Because that's how we're conditioned. Modern life is about being rewarded for being good and punished for being bad. But uh, this isn't about fear, it's about wisdom. So fear is, you know, I can frighten you into obeying me And you may do keep all the rules and behave yourself out of fear, but then with mindfulness, you know this is uh, you, you're aware of fear, and you, you, s you then I become I'm put in a position of a tyrant. Or the Buddha is not a tyrannical teacher. You know he's not. In the, he, you don't detect any tyrannical tendencies in. Buddha's teaching, because it's not based on fear, but on wisdom. Not on guilt and, and that, but on wisdom, awakening. So like living one's life, uh, like the, uh, in the Theravadan Buddhist style we have, the dana sila bhavana, dana is generosity, that when we're generous, uh, when we're not stingy and mean-hearted and selfish, that makes our life, we're, you know, we're a much more pleasant life. Uh, we, we're happier, when, you know, this thing of being totally selfish and and uh, ungrateful and thinking only of yourself uh, is not a, a, a mental state that is peaceful. When you look at it, when, when one has those kind of tendencies, you're aware of it as, uh, as it's dukkha, it's suffering to be uh, selfish. And then generosity <coughs> creates gratitude in the society, people are grateful and sharing things, uh, qualities like this we can, we can do to, m to make our lives pleasant ones and s develop a sense of self-respect, beginning to, to appreciate life in uh, the way we're living it through being generous. Or, and, and then the sila, the five precepts, it's a it's worthy of respect. One who attempts to keep the five precepts, so you you develop self-respect with dana sila. So the very foundation of Buddha Dhamma, in terms of individual living in society, isn't based on fear but on reflection. Uh, uh, to, we need to have a sense of self-worth, self-respect, even, you know, from 
from uh, you know our own actions and way we live. If we are living in a way we don't respect, then we're going to feel guilty and worthless and despairing. But Donna Sila brings this sense of of uh, hiri otapa into into our consciousness, sense of self respect and and uh, proper behavior in the society. So we're not, you know, being a force that causes division and and strife in in the family or in the society we're in. And this leads on to Bhavana, which is the cultivation of wisdom, the Eightfold Path. Oh, and this is the blessing of being born in the human form, human species. And yet, so much of modern life doesn't doesn't recognize that its power and and fear that tend to to be used. And they talk about morality, but even morality can be a threat. You know, you uh, refrain from immoral actions out of fear of going to hell rather than through understanding the suffering you create through unskillful actions and speech. When you observe the result of unskillful actions and speech, then, then, then there's wisdom. You say when you say things that you wish you hadn't, and there's guilt, remorse as a result of that. And then that's learning also that uh, better refrain from saying those kind of things. <laughs> Not only for the sake of others, but for your own peace of mind, happiness. Well, we have being born as a human mean we're still mammals, and <laughs> and we've got these basic primal uh, instincts, survival and procreation, and uh, so I mean these are kind of part of the package, you know. When you whether you're born as a as a dog or a human being, the the, you, you have these kind of primal uh, instincts for survival of the species and procreation of the species. And so uh, this, this is where the in, in, in the human species we can reflect on that. We're not just, uh, we can, we experience that same those same kind of feelings of fear, primal fear, and and anger and lust for, uh, for procreation. I mean, these are part of why we still 
multiply. I mean, there's more human beings on the planet than ever recorded. And um, there weren't this many human beings at the time of the Buddha. So this overpopulation is a question of, is of a problem to worry about in the future, <laughs> or now even, can they make it into a problem? But also, you can look at, at the potential for humanity, you know, as human beings, as we're, as we're allowed to be aware of the value of our humanity, where if it's just, you know, power and wealth and and uh, competitiveness and and get what you can for yourself and and um, then of course it does lead to destruction, war, misery, pain, grief, sorrow, despair, and anguish. But uh, do we really understand what it is to be human? And then the, the as I was saying before, previous days, like the Buddha. Buddha is, is about a human being who's awake and enlightened. And so it's not about, I mean, it, we respect the historical Shakyamuni Buddha, you know, because this is, you know, we, we have these memories, these, these perceptions of, of the founder of what we consider Buddhism to this day. But also, human beings can reflect on fear. You're not just a helpless, uh, lost in fear creature. You can be aware of, of greed, of hatred, of fear, of delusion, and so forth. And that's the Buddha knowing Dhamma. That's the Bhutang Tamang Sankang Dhammasami reference. I mean, these are poly words, you know, but I mean, they do have, uh, and Im they're very helpful as you go along to, to take, uh, you get a sense of real refuge as you internalize that and not just see it as a kind of external ceremony. Or seeing Buddha as some kind of Buddha nature in outer space or in the forest. I mean, it's here, you know, you're that. And, and, uh, Learning to to trust that, and then it leads leads on to to uh, being able to use these primal instincts, you know, like the stream enterer, the sotapanna, is uh, is aware of the human human made things that we that human beings create, such as the ego and the cultural, social conditioning, and the thinking process. But after stream entry, there's still sexual desire and, and anger, aversion. Because these are natural conditions that are part of the species, you know, the mammalian creatures that we are. But our relationship to them is reflecting on and no longer interpreting them in, in the sakya ditti, in the personal way. Like with sexuality, people, you know, this is a big qu question now about sexual orientation and people so strongly identified with, with their sexual uh, inclinations. And this becomes a whole raison d'etre for, for living and to, to be accepted in whatever sexual tendencies you might have. It becomes a strong identity. Being uh, <coughs> Jewish or something like this is a very strong identity with a perception. Or being, you know, a racial identity, being black or, or whatever is... These are these are strong identities that uh, we we believe in totally and commit ourselves to. Where with the stream entry, we we no longer we see through that tendency. It's not that we don't still have it, but 
we're not making it into into an obsession into a reason for action and speech and and li and livelihood so we have wisdom to guide us through to deal with with uh, the procreation uh, instincts and energies of, of a male or female body of the aversion anger that uh, that arise that we experience uh, and fear there's a lot to fear in the, in the in the planet earth you know there's not it's not like some neuroses where w if there's still uh, the self view then it becomes neurotic fear fear when there's when there's no need to be frightened and no wisdom operating around it just seen always interpreted as i have a fear problem it's it's uh, and we go to Psychotherapists to deal with it, <laughs> and <laughs> but actually, it's it, you know the sakadakami has to, it still has those those basic uh, primal instincts, but the, the there's wisdom seeing the path rather than right understanding to see it in terms of what it really is that uh, these are conditions arising ceasing so pace ankara and icha. Sapetamanata, all condition, f all dhamma is is no is not personal anymore. We don't interpret anger and fear and and uh, gr and sexual desire in terms of personal identity. We we see it in terms of its reality in the present, and as sankhara, that it has you know then. Like uh, aversion and anger, are kind of protective. Ma I mean, animal kingdom is, f is full of that. You know, just to to protect the the young or the uh, the co animals compete with each other. We've got these same kind of animal instincts, but our relationship to them changes from being being animals to a just following instinct to being Buddhas or refuge in Buddha to see them in terms of Sankharas. And then then there's the a moral agreements, uh, the five precepts, the ten precepts, eight precepts, ten precepts, monastic vinaya and so forth that that are agreements on behavior and on etiquette, on on uh, uh, relinquishing a lot, you know, uh, simplifying life. Monastic life is a simplification of life. So uh, I used to think being born as a human being was a curse. I thought you know it'd be better to be born as a sheep or a cow because <laughs> they they you know they have fear and anger, but they don't remember what happened five years ago, <laughs> or they don't seem to worry about the future <laughs> in Switzerland. I remember thinking it'd be nice to be a cow in Switzerland. But being a human being is, <laughs> I mean, you've got this retentive memory, you, you've got critical mind, and things are never good enough, you know, contentment is not part of modern life, you know, to be content means you're stupid. You said, you know, uh, modern free market capitalism all is about making you as discontented as possible. So last year's model is old-fashioned. You know, you're discontented with it. Can you imagine being content with your old car of two or three years ago when they're presenting you with something so much better. <laughs> and so you, you know, it winds you up into wanting, into to greed, and and being discontented. This is a society we live in. 
Now, just pointing it out that this is the way it is. I'm not, you know, I, it shouldn't be this way. Then I become idealistic. But this is the the social environment that affects us. But we can learn from it. You know, it's not about. It, it, we can't. You know, we should. Uh, it shouldn't be like this. Then we just complain about it. Or we just say nothing we can do, it's just the way it is, so what? And be resign ourselves. Or we can actually learn from it. You know, so how how uh, uh, a materialistic society, how it affects us. It affects us like this, makes us want things we don't need or be discontented with what we have. Is like this. So discontentment, you can't just be contented as an act of will. You know, you can attach to the idea of being contented, but contentment comes through seeing the suffering of discontentment. This is where monastic life excels, because the it's about con content with little, you know, so it's, um, it doesn't mean we're, that I was always content with what I had, but I became aware, more increasingly aware of the suffering I create through discontentment, through wanting things I didn't have, not be, and what I have not good enough. Just being aware of that mental state of wanting something I, better than what I have. So in in the Samana Sanya practices, they have these reflections that we chant in the pujas about being content with with the four requisites, with the shelter for the night, or alms food, um, medicine for illness that is made available, robes, so that, and the standard for these four requisites is as low as you can get, like, uh, Bangs of Kula cloth, which is, you know, there's these uh, papa uh, ceremonies from Thailand where they offer, uh, it's, a, it's a, that means forest cloth, meaning throwaway cloth found in the forest. And then the then they lay disciples gain so much respect for the early bhikkhus that they asked the Buddha if they could offer a good cloth because the, B the Buddha allowed us to pick up rags and cloth that the villagers had discarded to make our robes. You know, so we could go into charnel grounds and take take the cloth off corpses and you can imagine anything more desperate than that. And, <laughs> and uh, and then the villagers wanted to offer, you know, good cloth as an offering. The Buddha allowed that. So that's like the Katina ceremonies after the Pansa and 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 the Tawain forest cloth. Sometimes in Sri Lanka, I think, they even drape the cloth over trees. And you could, <laughs> you know, like new robes and that. This is a way of, this part of the ceremony of offering. But it, it, it's like, it doesn't mean that you're always content with your robes, but you're also aware of discontentment. And, and through that, you, you let go of the discontentment. It's, it's like, you know, when you know that putting your finger in the flame of the candle hurts, you just you immediately withdraw it. You don't seek to be hurt and harmed anymore. So, it's time for me to cease. <laughs>